Let's start. Basically, what, what I uh, wanted to do is take this text by Heidegger, that's the starting point. It's like an interlude, a little bit. Um, for me, we should close the door. So I basically, I, I, I hope you've all been able to read, uh, read, read it. Um, and let me tell you why I thought it would be important for us to talk about this. Um, so we're, we, we're trying to we're trying to think about the notion of process, of change, of movement um, as a kind of basic philosophical idea. And uh, we've looked at uh, a block text from the dialectic, how the dialectic functions, and there we have seen a, a, in a clear way how the notion of, of dialectic, certainly Bloch's materialist dialectic or dialectic materialism, is a kind of process philosophy. It's about how things uh, always carry within them their contradiction, latent contradiction, and that's then worked out in a movement, in, in, a, in a process of change and evolution or growth. And how for Bloch ultimately this dialectic is not, um, yeah, it's, it's not something that is com completed in the, in the mind, in the, in, in the intellectual understanding of the world, but how the world itself is still caught up in a dialectical movement. There are really existing contradictions for Bloch, that's class, um, but also uh, the, the conflict between nature and, and mind, or, or, or uh, matter and spirit, you might say, uh, or the, the alienated world and uh, the divine, or the kingdom that is yet to come, or something like that. All these contradictions are real, they are working themselves out in the world in a way that is oriented towards some sort of resolution of them, but we cannot tell what that resolution is or whether it will ever come about. Uh, it, it is the stuff of hope, it is the stuff of utopia. And um, so he takes Hegel's idea of a, of a dialectical development, but makes it something material and concrete, and uh, we look at how he does that. And that's a kind of uh, idea of process, you might say. So reality is not the fixed thing that um, uh, is just identical with itself, as we might think initially about what, what is something real, that is something that is, that is what it is, you know. Uh, no, reality is far more that which is not what it is, that which is not yet what it is. Um, and so reality or, or being is radically underdetermined or, or undetermined. Yeah? Uh, and that's why it's still in movement. That's a point that for Bloch is very important. Heidegger, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Hegel, sometimes people get, say that in Hegel's philosophy the principle of non-contradiction does not hold because Hegel says something can carry a real contradiction within itself. But when you look a little bit closer, then of course Hegel, say, Hegel does not say the principle of contradiction doesn't hold. He just says there are real contradictions and they cannot make, stay the way they are. They have to resolve themselves. A contradiction has to resolve itself. That's why there is the dialectic. So that is a reinforcement of the principle of non-contradiction. In the end, there cannot a contradiction that exists cannot stay in existence because it needs to be resolved in some way or another. That sets the whole thing in, in movement. Um, and that is a, so. Of course, when you look at the history of that's limit ourselves to the history of German thought, then um, there are of course many different approaches to thinking about. 
these fundamental questions, what is the nature of existence and, and how to think movement and how to think identity. Um, and dialectical thinking is just one of them. Um, and of course you can contrast it with all sorts of other things. And there's only limited value in, uh, in just looking at what somebody else said. So that's, when, we, when we look at Heidegger, we get a very different way of thinking so different from Hegel that you might say, why would you want to bring them in dialogue with each other? Uh, Hegel denies the, the, maybe not the possibility, but certainly the usefulness of a dialectical way of thinking. And uh, he thinks that that is a kind of an attempt to, uh, as he says, reflect yourself out of, uh, out of the problems of philosophy um, by um, by resolving contradictions at a higher level, but it becomes purely, purely abstract or intellectual, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't succeed in thinking what needs to be thought when we think about uh, philosophical questions. And I think that. So I don't want what I don't want to do is to um, just put Heidegger's voice in there as another another kind of voice. Somebody who looks at these questions from a completely different viewpoint and we would then be sitting here like judges uh, you know and watching uh, Hegel and Heidegger or Bloch and Heidegger fight it out uh, amongst each other and, and that, that kind of, I think that is a very common way of talking about philosophy today which you find in many universities that I, or it, the whole discipline the history of philosophy is organized like that we, we as people today think that we can just have this overview of uh, what everybody thought in history and we can compare. And I think that's a very abstract way of thinking. That doesn't really do justice to, to the nature of philosophy as a, something that requires that we go with a thinker and go into what they have tried to, to, to see and say and then look at it from from their perspective and a more imminent approach. So that's not why I think we should look at the text from these and the right on the essence of truth. Um, it's slightly different, it's more systematic. Um, it's, it's, it's more a question of um, asking ourselves what are we trying to do when we, and that question has come up a couple of times already, what, what are we trying to do when we try to think about this, this, this fundamental metaphysical level of the, the nature of, of being? What, what, what are we trying to, to achieve here? I've said several times that um, it can't be the point, of, again, it can't be the point that we say, oh well, there have been a lot of philosophers who have said that what really exists is substance, is a self-identical thing and um, the process philosophers have just you know have just um, provided an alternative uh, an alternative account which is different because it doesn't talk about substances but it talks about events and processes but it's just just as one side it because one side talks about what is identical fixed and static and the other one talks about what is moving the point of process philosophy, as Wright well also says, would certainly be to, 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 to think those things together. And that's, of course, also what Aristotle does. We talked about that, Aristotle's notion of substance, which lies at the basis also of, of Hegel, yeah, is a way of, um, of, of precisely doing that, thinking change as something that happens to something that remains constant in the process of change. I change over time, but I'm still the person that I was 10 years ago. Um, that is precisely the function of the concept of substance, that it allows us to have something that's unchangeable, the substance, the essence, and something that changes the, the qualities or the accidents. And so at that level, that also process philosophy operates. So it's not, process philosophy is not a kind of attempt to say everything moves, um, and there is nothing else. No, it's an attempt to think change is precisely this paradoxical phenomenon. So what has that got to do with uh, truth? That is the question. 
Why are we now suddenly talking about truth? And why, why do we do that by looking at uh, Heidegger's text, uh, which, uh, yeah, well, I think it's quite an interesting text, but maybe, I don't know if people are familiar with reading Heidegger, but um, some, some people find, do you, do you find it difficult, or what do you think about it? What's okay? Yeah, I, I just, I find the ideas he is expressing here, I feel a lot of this. Okay, oh, that's good. Yeah, great. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Did you say? yeah. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what did and I did lose him, like, in around the middle. Okay, yeah. But he does like, I mean, he's very... The, the writing is very structured, yeah. and he explains every claim he makes. So yeah. Yeah. maybe I just didn't. I think I also didn't take enough time. Okay, <laughs> to okay. be fair. What did you think about it? Um, yeah. So the first few pages, um, I kind of understood, but it got more complicated when when he talks about um, uh, concealment and disclosure. Yeah. Found that a bit tricky to understand. I would be good to, to go into that, kind of yeah. break that down yeah. again. Yeah. Um, I found it quite interesting when he talks about truth is in essence freedom. Yeah, exactly. Talking about the, the notion of freedom. Yeah. That was quite good. Yeah, but there are a few bits which would, would be good if we could okay, kind good. of break yeah. it down. Same what did you think of this? Um, well, I've read Heidegger before, so yeah. I like his writings, but I'm eager to hear what you have to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay, good, great, that's wonderful. So, I think that um, if we if we ask this, if we put this question of process at this fundamental level, what what, what is process? Um, then. It is not just so. It, it's not just a question of what, I, what what we just said. It's not just a question of movements or events as opposed to things. No. What what is a what is a process? What is a what is a, an event? Is a coming into being and a passing away. Something comes into being. And when, it, when the process of the event is over, it's passed away. So, when we think about process philosophy, we are talking, as far as if it's a metaphysical question that we're talking about. And how to assess this at the beginning, what is, what is philosophy? Yeah, it's, das Wissen von Wesen in the science, the knowing of the, the essence of being, yeah. I mean, we all know that these words are impossible to translate adequately into English, yeah? Das Wesen der Sein, it's not the essence of being, but that's how we translate Wesen. So, if we think at that level, and that's what, what we want, what we have to do if process philosophy is going to be a philosophy, then we're not talking about movement as such, or change as such initially, or at, let's say at the most fundamental level, no, we're talking about coming into being and passing away. We're talking about becoming and perishing, as it were. And that's, that was my idea, that there is this, there's a different perspective. We can talk about processes, events, move what they are, how they differ from each other, how they relate to, to things that exist, uh, you know, this sort of categorical question, or categorical question, how is the category of processes different from the category of things, for example, um, or we can ask a question which I don't know, we call ontological, not, not in terms of what are the categories of being, but what does it mean to be, what is the, the essence of being itself. And there we can talk about process. 
and we can say non process has to do with becoming and perishing. Yeah? Then um, I think we have achieved a deeper level of questioning, and we can understand also why the dialectic can be seen at that level, because the dialectic, as we have seen in Bloch's text, is also a movement of becoming and perishing, of coming into being and passing away. Yeah? Now, this, the question then becomes, so how do we think about coming into being and passing away? How do we think about this, this idea of becoming? Uh, if you remember when the first session, I talked about these four contrasts that, that Heidegger draws in his text on metaphysics, being, being and nothing, being and becoming is an ought of the hand design and so on. And um, what was the other one? Be sign in China to be to, to be and to appear. Yeah? And Heidegger there suggests uh, that sign the Adam being becoming is the, the the most superficial one of the of the four contrasts in being and, and uh, the most profound one is being and nothing, sign, sign and needs. Um, and of course, Hegel's dialectic is is a way of saying sein and needs is becoming. Sein and becomes becoming. Hegel makes the same point at the beginning of the logic. Um, so this is the this is the question: being and becoming. What becomes, or what is this becoming, and, w and what is this perishing? And that's where I think the notion of truth um, becomes important. And uh, n not necessarily the way Heidegger understands truth, but because I think, having read the text now again, I've read it many times. Um, I think Heidegger here, he knows very well what he's, write, what he's writing about, <laughs> of course. It's very clear text in many ways. Um, but it's also very, very, uh, very, it's, it, it's rooted in a classical scholastic understanding of truth. It's not, um, it's not all his thoughts, uh, whereas it, he presents it very much as if he just sits down and writes these things, but he's got the handbooks on the side to, uh, to check everything, I'm pretty sure of it. We could, we could do a whole analysis of that text, but and from that perspective, we won't do that. We'll just highlight some highlights on, it, uh, on the, the main points. To get to, to, the, to the, well, the, the most important point indeed, as you said, uh, is the, the, the claim that, that truth is in essence freedom. And that, uh, I think, uh, start, will help us to understand something in the philosophical depth, this notion of process. So that's where, where I want to get to. Uh, to show that being and becoming, sorry, sorry, that becoming and perishing, so process, I'm now redefining process as, as becoming and perishing. that this actually is the process of truth is what he calls here freedom what he also calls the open Freedom, the open, and uh, the, the the disclosure. Yeah. Yeah, or what was it called? Yeah, yes, yeah, disclosure. Huh? Disclosure. Disclosure. Yeah. And bearing. And and especially, uh, I think that the the freedom and the open 
that is what we have to understand as being categories of Newton's word moments of process, moments of the, the dynamic, the moving, the, the becoming. Yeah? No becoming without freedom, no becoming without the open, and freedom and the open are the, 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 the requirements for, for truth, and therefore also for, for being as parents. That's what I wanted to explore, and because that will then help us to understand or to not forget when we go on that we are talking about this level of fundamental ontology, not about uh, a theory of the categories. That's the point. In a deeper sense, there is a question about categoriality, which I hinted at last time uh, when I referred to uh, to Joseph Owen's book on uh, Aristotle's uh, metaphysics, the, 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 the notion of being an expert in physics. But maybe we'll get to that later on, because that's, that would be a bit uh, confusing to bring that in now. Yeah? Okay. Let's try to have a discussion about this text. So, what are the main points in it? Well, what is the, what is how you're trying to say? What do you have? You said you understood it all. And not in the way that I can tell you about it. But uh, <laughs> when I left, I thought, yeah. Well, I can say what he says at the beginning. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, how does it start? What is the? He starts with the common understanding of truth, which has to do with um, the accordance between proposition statements yeah. and some objective reality. And he first explained how is that understood and that even that um, common understanding has at least two meanings. Um, but then at the end, he touches on this um, accordance, so at what level is the proposition or the statement accorded with the, the matter or the thing itself. Uh, okay, that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 can you add to that? Um, so the truth is the correspondence of matter and knowledge, so that relation between knowledge and matter. And that was like in the first part, something that yeah. helped to understand what the essence of truth, um, how that can be explained. And then that, that presupposes some divine ideal, right? Something that is created. Yeah. Um, before we even make the statement or the, have an experience of that matter. Yeah. Uh, and then he says something about um, there is like one sentence that creation by the divine. That means sort of creation of the human. I think it's at the beginning of. Um, okay. This I, I this is one of the things I got already lost. Uh, okay. Let's, let's, go, let's go back a little bit okay. yeah? and say, how does Heidegger ask us to get into this question? So, what is, what, what is the question? What is the question? Uh, we've now I've told a little bit about why I think we should talk about this. So, what is the question that we are talking about? 
what the essence of truth is, what we understand by truth. Yeah. What what is truth? Um, and how that's right. And how does Heidegger get us into that question? Well, that's a philosophical question. Yeah, so what does that mean? It's a philosophical question. Um, he, he, in that first paragraph, that first, that first bit, the first four paragraphs until chapter one. Yeah, it's about the common sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's about the common sense um, that that is based on something actual. Or that's um, some something that's obvious. Exactly. Yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it totally obvious? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so uh, is it obvious? And are we moving when we, when we think about? I think the great thing about Heidegger is that, although I agree with, disagree with everything he says, that, that um, he is a real philosopher. He, he really knows how to ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, is it, so he, the, the, in, you see in the beginning that he is talking about, on the one hand he's saying, this is totally obvious. And on the other hand, he is saying precisely that it's obvious that is so uh, difficult to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a double, double thing going on with the obvious or the self-evident. Oh. Well, I don't want to say it all. Go on. So how, how, let me just look at, can we just look at the opening of the text? Mm -hmm. what, is, what does it say? You always have to get higher, right? You always have to. Uh... Excuse me, I have to leave. But oh, the, you obvious, have to go already. the the obvious is uh, is what conceals. <laughs> I'll see you next time. The unconcealment. I'll see you next time. Okay, see you. See you. So, with Heidegger, we always have to, I think, look at all the words, yeah? From these in the Wahrheit is the Rede. I think we can now also just read German, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. From these in the Wahrheit is the Rede. So we're talking about the essence of truth. Die Frage nach dem Wesen der Wahrheit kümmert sich nicht darum, ob die Wahrheit jeweils eine Wahrheit der praktischen Lebenserfahrung oder einer wirtschaftlichen Berechnung, je die Wahrheit einer technischen Überlegung oder der politischen Klugheit, im Besonderen eine Wahrheit der wissenschaftlichen Forschung oder einer künstlerischen Gestaltung oder gar die Wahrheit einer denkenden Besinnung oder eines kultischen Glaubens ist. Von all dem sieht die Wesensfrage weg und blickt in das eine hinaus, was jede Wahrheit überhaupt als Wahrheit auszeichnet. So this question, yeah? Yeah, it's a more general question than we tend to often ask um, when we compartmentalize truth in like so what's the truth of art what's the truth of literature to try and find in a sense an, an essence of each yeah. subject but here he's asking about kind of what this m notion of truth when we think of it in, in those specific aspects has in common in all these aspects so what is this essence what is its essence? Yeah. yeah. What does it have in common? Yeah. 
we're not talking about any particular kind of truth. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about, you might also say, we're not talking about the truth content. So we're not talking about the truth of a particular practical experience or a particular economic calculation or not even of the truth of a thinking reflection. We're not talking about the, the truth content. We're talking about what makes all these truths true. Yeah? So we're talking about, and this is interesting to note, maybe, he says, the question, the Wesensfrage, so the question about the essence, looks away. He, he also uses the word, so this question is not concerned, is not interested in uh, any kind of particular truth or, or untruth or falsehood. No, this question is concerned with, it looks away from all of that and looks for some one thing, das eine, was jede Wahrheit überhaupt als Wahrheit auszeichnet. In the footnote, with the, the second word of the text from Wesen, mm -hmm. there's a little footnote there, yeah? Uh, these are, I think, his, uh, the, the Handbemerkungen, which he wrote in, uh, in his copy of, the, of an earlier version of the text. And he, he lists here three uh, meanings of the word wesen. Now wesen is, is usually the translation of uh, essentia, uh, so that, and that's where the essence comes from. But wesen is also uh, a nominalized verb. Uh, so it's also uh, to, to be, yeah? Uh, so there's a verbal element. And so he says the first meaning is kriditas, the what, the koinon. The koinon is the, the common, yeah? So is that what, which things have in common. So every human being shares something with every human being, because we're all human beings. And that's the, that's what we have in common. And you could call that the essence. But you can also call the essence a möglichung bedingung der möglichkeit, that which makes it possible, a condition of possibility, or it can even be a ground of this condition of possibility. What is so there are three? This goes down, you know, three levels down. So you can look at it as a general concept, the what of it. But you can also ask what makes particular truths possible and then in what is this possibility grounded. Indeed, these are, I think, already here three different uh, levels that are at play. Yeah? So it is not, and then that comes out because he says in the next paragraph, Doch versteigen wir uns mit der Frage nach dem Wesen nicht in die Lehre des Allgemeinen, die jedem Denken den Atem versagt. So, if thinking about truth is just about a general concept, then does this not become an empty abstraction? And does this not show the Verstiegenheit of the Fragens? Does that not show the groundlessness, the perspicuous a la philosophy? So this is a kind of objection. Yeah? So first you say we ask with the essence of truth. This is not interesting. In this question is not interested in a particular truth, but but is interested in what every truth makes make what makes every truth a truth. So. Well, is that not a question that shows how broken laws or, or the, the different trusting that yeah, all philosophy really is? If, it would, if, if thinking would be rooted, would be turned towards reality, 
dann first of all, we äh, muss er zuerst und ohne Umschweife darauf dringen, die wirkliche Wahrheit, die uns heute Maß und Stand gibt, gegen die Verwirrung des Meinens und Rechnens aufzurichten. Was soll angesichts der wirklichen Not, die von allen wirklich, wirklichen Absehen der abstrakte Frage nach dem Wesen der Wahrheit, ist die Wesensfrage nicht das Unwesentlichste und das Unverbindlichste, was überhaupt gefragt werden kann? You see how it nicely turns it around now. Is this question into the essence of being not the most inessential thing <laughs> that we can ask? Well, we cannot just dismiss that question. We cannot just ignore the, the, the seriousness of this question. But who asks this question? That's the common sense, yeah? The common sense. And this common sense, now he says something important. Pocht auf die Forderung des handgreiflichen Nutzens. So, makes itself proud of its, uh, of its, uh, its demand for practical utility. It, the common sense says, yeah, you know, if I can't do anything with it, then what's the point? You know? It has to be useful in some sense. And not just that, it also actively resists effort. Eifert, that's always very bad for hiding. <laughs> Iphone. Because Eifern is the opposite of uh, Gelassenheit. Yeah? And for Heidegger, we can only start to philosophize and to understand what, for example, truth is if we do this from an attitude of Gelassenheit, or if we find in ourselves how, when we approach texts like this, how much we are ourselves put in the position of the Eifern, the laser, who wants to grab what is in here. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, he's confronting us with that. Er pocht auf die Forderung des handgreiflichen Nutzes und eifert gegen das Wissen vom Wesen des Seienden, welches wesentliche Wissen seit langem Philosophie heißt. So common sense and philosophy are actually enemies. Yeah. That's true. That's Even true. Nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, yeah? I think also that that's true. Common sense and, uh, and philosophy are enemies. Okay? We all start to speak like Trump. It would be <laughs> in the ways, yeah? Very important. So important. Uh, So why is that important? Or what, what is this? Uh, what is that this philosophical question? However, here I, I think he stayed. He stayed. He stayed. He stays that way. Heidegger says also, uh, you know, uh, I said that before, I think, philosophy is for the vegan and that it's for the, the few and the rare. And uh, it's just something that a lot of people have nothing to do with. Common sense has its own necessity. It insists on its right with the only question, with the only weapon that it has, and that is its appeal to what is self-evident, self-sustainable. We have already seen that this whole theory, well, it's not theory, but the whole disclosure of what we mean by truth 
in the end also in, insists on Selbstverständlichkeit in a different way. So Heidegger can only, the, the whole movement of philosophy is to turn our minds around to something that is actually obvious, that lies open into view. There is no other appeal. Philosophy could never have another kind of sort of argument to back it up than ultimately an appeal to, to, to what is self-evident. And that comes out, I think, strongly in, 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 in the notion of truth as it is elaborated here. So that's a different kind of self-verständlichkeit. Here, self-verständlich means, in, in, when, when common sense speaks of self-verständlichkeit, it means that which does not require reflection, or that which does not bear uh, thinking about. Whereas the kind of Selbstverständlichkeit which philosophy seeks is the one that comes to life only in thinking, only in. Uh, and I, I think it's a very uh, vulnerable point that it's very easy to close your eyes to or to say, yeah, okay, come on already, I want to, you know, just tell me what you have to say. Um, and that's something that Heidegger, I think, always resists. And the whole the whole text can can um, escape you if you don't I think if you don't try to get into the the mindset with which he thinks you know, the way he wants you to to, to think about it yeah? if you reduce it to a number of theses and you say okay so this is what he has to say about truth then I think we, we miss the, what the text uh, what the text can give us um, and that's something that is typical for philosophy in general but certainly for, that's why I, it comes so strongly out in Heidegger it's, uh, it's almost as if you can so somebody who doesn't have a, a philosophical bone in their body they just run through the text and, and they would probably just be able to read it and uh, wouldn't think about it uh, you know, but would totally miss what's going on there I think. Um, so reading this becomes itself also a, a what I would want to call a process, an ontological process. Um, philosophy has nothing to do with common sense. Can't, can't even refute it uh, because, exactly what I just said, common sense is blind. For that, was sie vor dem Wesensblick stellt. Überdies halten wir uns selbst in der Verständlichkeit des gemeinen Verstandes, sofern wir uns in jenen vielförmigen Wahrheiten der Lebenserfahrung, des Handelns, des Forschens, Gestaltens und Glaubens gesichert wehnen. Wir selbst betreiben die Auflehnung des Selbstverständlichen gegen jeden Anspruch des Fragwürdigen. What does that mean? Say there. But we don't even, um, really want to ask this question. Yeah. I mean, in this sentence, it is. Uh, so, what is, what, why does he say this here? Yeah, we selbst betreiben die Auflehnung des Selbstverständlichen gegen jeden Anspruch des Fragwürdigen. 
the assets, who's the assets? So it must be we, we as readers, yeah? We come to this text even thinking, oh well, now let's find out what, uh, what this uh, mm -hmm. dude has got to say about it, you know? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Die Aufregung des Selbstverständlichen gegen jeden Anspruch des Fragwürdigen. And he takes these words quite literally. Yeah? There is a, an address, an appeal of that which is worthy of question. <laughs> das Fragwürdige. Yeah? That which is... That which... That's how we reach this word. Yeah? Fragwürdig. Uh, no, I don't understand that. What does this mean? The answer to this question. What does that refer to? That, that we are so deeply in that, in embedded in this common sense logic, that even if he here initially stayed like already made this turn to see that the point of philosophy is to ask what the common sense doesn't want us to ask um, that by itself won't convince us that we would actually now seriously consider this question of the essence of truth because we are kind of predisposed to not yeah. seriously consider this question yeah I'm trying to So as long as we assume that we are secure in the many the manifold truths of our experience, of our acting, of our researching, shaping or believing, we have not exposed ourselves to what this this question asks of us, maybe this and then yeah, I think that's that is for Heidegger's really point. Yeah. So he also talks about uh, the Designsfrage or, or the Frage nach dem Design, and he talks about uh, uh, Exposition der Designsfrage which does not just mean to, 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 to expose or expound on the question of being, but also means to expose oneself to the question that being asks of us, as it were. That's an existential, authentic moment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what goes for the question of being also goes for this question as to the essence of truth. It is a question that addresses us. So, as long as we keep ourselves in the attitude of, even the philosophical attitude of, gosh, that's really interesting, yeah, I wonder what truth is, I never really knew, so let's find out. Yeah? Then we miss something of what he's trying to make us uh, aware of. That we are ourselves implicated, implied, in this question, that it, as a familiar point from Bloch too, eh? the question, so the, the, the unconstructible question, the unconstructible frage, that is located in the heart of being, is a, is, a, is a question of the world to us and a question of us to the world. It goes in both directions. The question the question itself becomes somehow part of, of, of what's going on here.
But we want to know what, um, how, how it is VS written into the state. We ask for the goal that people uh, uh, set that they mention in their machine to infuse these disaster and so on. So what should we strive after? Uh, like the utopia or whatever. Uh, people want the real truth, so they want they want the truth. And then he says, so do we then know what what truth means? Or do we only know this gefühls mesi und im Allgemeinen? Yeah? So remember, again, you said the, the question of the essence of truth is the question to the, the general, but it's not the general. It's the one. Allein ist dieses ungefähre Wissen und die Gleichgültigkeit dagegen nicht elender als das bloße Nichtkennen des Wesens der Wahrheit. Because if we don't know the essence of truth, then we have no connection with this question into the essence of truth, whatever, and we don't yet know really what that means, yeah? <coughs> well, he says, it's almost better to, to not yeah. ask that question than to get it completely wrong what that question is, yeah? And we get it completely wrong if we think, oh, we're just talking about an, a general concept or, or uh, something, uh, self-evident in, 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 in that sense. No, the question of truth is an Anspruch of something that is fragwürdig. <laughs> yeah? That's difficult, huh? I think it's very difficult. It is very difficult. I still, still don't quite get my head around this sentence. Wir selbst betreiben die Auflehnung des Selbstverständlichen gegen jeden Anspruch des Fragwürdigen. Ist das eine quite complicated? How is it translated into English? Um, it says, we ourselves intens intensify that resistance which the obvious has to every demand made by what is questionable. Yeah. He's, he's almost saying that we are sort of, we, we, we are our own worst enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are kind of the mediator, no? not the, ca the carrier of, uh, of this common sense evilness or badness. Yeah, yeah. It's, maybe I'm not even sure that, it, that it's that it's evil. It's, or it's, it, it's yeah. just the 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 unphilosophical. The, yeah. the unphilosophical. Yeah, but we do it, do this ourselves. So what what do you still not understand? Yeah, I, I'm I'm just thinking of an example. Can we just just think about an example of a situation, perhaps? Um, yeah. Well, we can't apply the sentence. Yeah. Um, can you try? Can you try? Wir selbst betreiben die des Selbstverständlichen. So, what is the what, what is the Auflehnung des Selbstverständlichen? If something that is Common sense. If is it if we question, if we proactively question, what is common sense? Whether common sense is truth. Whether whether common sense. Whether the obviously common sense is true. But then it continues gegen jeden Anspruch des Fragwürdigen. Perhaps I just need to let that linger a little bit longer. <laughs> we, I mean, we can continue and I'll just give that another thing. So I, I think that, I mean, it applies to many different examples, but, but I think um, 
it applies to certainly also applies to a particular way in which we do uh, philosophy. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the academic attitude towards philosophy, where you think, you know, oh, we have this question, what is truth? Yeah, that doesn't belong anywhere else. Now that somebody's talking about it, so we'll talk about it. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's look at uh, what everybody has said about it, and let's try to settle that question. Yeah. yeah? So now we know. So, you know, you've been okay. to the seminar, and yeah. give me the answer. Yeah. That <laughs> and, and then if you can't, then, then the common sense will say, well, that was a waste of time. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, I think this is what he's trying to... to, to okay. In, in, in our yeah. context, what, he, what, what it means here. So, and, I, I mean, you know, we always have to ask, yeah, okay, it doesn't make sense, but... Um, Maybe we should first try to understand what he's trying to say, and then we can we can ask what we think of it. Um, so he contrasts that attitude. He says that is a kind of so you think you're asking the question, but actually you're intensifying your uh, resistance to this question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. By settling it, by wanting to. To have it all ordered and to yeah. understand, so you don't have to think about it. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah. So philosophy can be thinking, or it can be trying to stop thinking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and that's why he says, "Anspruch des Fragwürdigen." That is something that continues. Yeah. And Anspruch is a kind of yeah, is a demand or an appeal okay. or a claim. Okay. Uh, but, 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 but he always takes the words literally, yeah? so it's, for, it's also a, an address, mm-hmm. an Ansprach uh, mm-hmm. in the Dutch, yeah? so it's, it's an Ansprechen, yeah. jemand Ansprechen, yeah? yeah? Mm-hmm. My, 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 my teacher was a Hungarian, a big Hungarian. And he said to him, and this helps him to understand this, in, uh, in, a, in a particular part of the Netherlands there is this, this old, uh, 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 farmer's tradition in, 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 in the countryside. If in a village somebody has died, then the, the family of the person who has died go to all the houses to announce the, 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 the death of, the, of this person. And that is called uh, Anspruch, Anspruch. So you, you go and knock on the door, and then you you, you speak to the to the people, person who opens the door that so and so has died, and then they give you a drink. Yeah. And then he said, so after a few houses, you don't have to say anything. <laughs> 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 so, so Anspruch can be can can be worthless, but it is a it is an it draws you in. Mm-hmm. So this question tries to to uh, to get you. Get you. Mm-hmm. It has. It mm-hmm. wants something. Yeah. Um, and this is very important to understand disclosure. So mm-hmm. disclosure doesn't doesn't mean uh, an anonymous opening up. But the disclosure also has this directedness. It is always linked in how it is thought to data. So that is disclosure or disclosure to something or someone. Mm-hmm. But we can begin to see maybe that Anspruch des Fragwürdigen, if we uh, take it for what it means, have, starts to move already in this direction of the free and the open. An Anspruch has to happen in a kind of yeah, opening, otherwise uh, there is no place for it. And it can be, as he quite clearly shows in the beginning here, mm-hmm. it can be rejected or taken up. It can be misrecognized or not noticed. Uh, there is a kind of, usually here for, that's his implication for the worse, there is a kind of total possibility to completely ignore it. So we are completely free in a way, yeah. 
we are completely free when the essence of truth the, the das Wesen der Wahrheit you might want in English want to say that the, the the beingness of 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 truth it's you know Wesen if you hear it uh, ver, as a as a verb Heidegger sometimes also talks about it as it says beast so some, something <laughs> is is <laughs> So the, the ising of, of being, of the ising of truth, that, that what he's talking about, is um, is something that is always there, without which it creates the open, without which all these so-called self-evident truths could could never be. But whether we recognize it or see it or not, whether we allow ourselves to face into the direction of sight of this. Anspruch. That is uh, that is philosophy. When we do that, then we are philosophizing. That's something else than having an abstract theory of truth. But you see, this is it's also very difficult. You have to use these words to to uh, to say this. But these words are not concepts. They, they, they're not. It's not a theory. That it is uh, that this is what Heidegger calls the denken, why, why thinking is something else than theorizing. Yeah? But but we're beginning to see that that what he is trying to, to do in this text is putting us in touch with a kind of original, originary openness or givenness of being, of whatever is. And that he says that that is truth. That is the essence of truth. That is essence of truth. We can now understand it's not in the sense of the definition of it. What every truth shares with every other truth, but the essence in the sense of the beingness of it. That which, well, that what happens when there is truth. Yeah. You you look very skeptical. What do you think? Yeah, you. Oh, Sorry, but I no, think. No, no. You look very skeptical about this. Well, yes, there is a lot in this one sentence. Yeah, so it's, that is certainly the case. So, I'll make a whole essay about this one sentence. You could write a whole book on that sentence, yeah. Exactly, that's right, yeah. Wir selbst betreiben die Auflegung des Selbstverständlichen gegen jeden Anspruch des Fragwürdigen. Solution, it's a solution for the title of a thesis. Or it's also maybe a good defense in your father. If you don't know how to answer a question, then we say, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You see, the well, point is, or that this is this is a, this first first uh, section is quite a cleverly thought out way of trying to to get us to see something, and I would like to add to make sure that only those who already know it get it, and those who don't think that they're just having a nice time reading an interesting essay but haven't got the phobias what what's going on, yeah. And then we get the Geläufige Begriff der Wahrheit, and to this, yeah, so this talks about, you know, um,
Schulz als, als Übereinstimmung. In der in the classical philosophy, there was this idea that, uh, and he talks about it, of course, still classical definition of truth, that truth is, is the, the correspondence of thought and reality, or correspondence of the, of the proposition with the fact. Um, that is the, the truth, the tr truth as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an aspect of knowledge, knowing. When what you have in your mind corresponds with what is the case, then your thoughts is true. Or if your proposition corresponds with what is the case, it's true. Like Aristotle's famous definition of truth from the and posterior analytics to say of that which is so, that it is so, mm -hmm. is true. Or to say that which is so, that it is so, or to say that which is not so, that it is not so, is true. To say that which is so, that it is not so, or that which is not so, that it is so, is false. And that is truth as correspondence. And that's been a very important uh, definition of truth, and still mm -hmm. is. Yeah? Uh, but that can be, well, that's one thing to keep in mind. But then there is um, true, and truth is not the same as true. Uh, true truth is maybe we, ca we could say in this sense. So in, in Latin, it's it's uh, which is veritas, which is uh, is an abstract noun. Truthness, or trueness, and theory. Is, is the true or, you know, of, of the of the LA. So we talk about I mean that's also very classical but he gives the same he has the same discussion. We talk about uh, a true friend or uh, a true joy. It's a true joy. <laughs> es ist eine wahre Freude an der Bewältigung dieser Aufgabe nicht zu arbeiten. That's a little bit funny, a little bit of a joke, I think, in light of what we just uh, heard about the practical spirit. Um, or we speak of a true friend, or of true love, or of true grit. There are all sorts of contexts in which we use this word true to mean uh, real, he says. Das Wahre ist das Wirkliche. So we speak of das, vom wahren Gold im Unterschied zum falschen. And in English you would then probably say real gold. Yeah? So there you can, would say it's real or not fake, or real or not false. Mm -hmm. So there you see already that, that uh, this use of the word wahr is, uh, is closely related to, to real. And that's, a, that's a something else. So, so we, we might say that truth is correspondence, that's kind of cognitive truth, or that's maybe a kind of logical truth, or the truth of the proposition. Mm. Uh, whereas this truth is, um, and I think the scholastics called it that way, they, they, they would call it real, real truth, a truth that applies to things. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between things that are what they are, and things that appear to be what they are, but aren't. Mm -hmm. So it's the it's it's the, the difference between truth and, and appearance, or truth and uh, yeah yeah sh uh, shine. Yeah. So it's find it difficult to translate that into English because it doesn't really work exactly mm -hmm. the same way. But in, in German we have the word shine, um, and so unreal. Yeah, and then of course you can say, well, a shine gold, fake gold, is also something real, but it's not really gold. It's it is real, but it's real as something else. Yeah, that's quite quite clear. So that's so we have two two. Uh, there you go. No. Oh. We we have two uh, notions of truth now. We have the truth as correspondence, which applies to propositions or ideas, mm -hmm. contents and relation they have to reality. Then we have truth as 
something that applies to things mm -hmm. when we can say they are, they are they are what they are or they seem to be what what they are and so they are not really what they are a true friend is a, is a really friend uh, but you can also have a somebody you, you think is a friend but they're not apparently it is possible for things to only seem to be something yeah, <laughs> yeah? That's a big point. That it would be that way. That's quite a, a remarkable thing. Yeah? Can I just add something? Yeah. Um, I mean, I forgot a little bit what he says afterwards, but now I'm just trying to think what really is the difference between those two um, ways or these this two um, meanings of truth. Because if I say, um, this is gold, then I'm evaluating the proposition, yeah. whether it's true or false, yeah. right? Yeah. But with respect to something that I already think from before, what is gold or not? But if I say, this is true gold, yeah. then I'm looking and the thing, as you said, if it's if it just appears or is it actually so? Yeah. But again, it's with respect to something that I have in mind. What gold is? Right? Yeah. So is this just the difference really that uh, in the first case I'm looking at the proposition and comparing it to my. I mental image, and in second one, I'm looking at the the thing. Yeah, is that the case? Uh, say the first statement again. Your first statement was Th this, this is gold. This is gold. Yeah, which is a statement. Yeah, yes, yeah. And then it can, I can say, it can true. It can is this truth gold? or not? Is this yeah? Well, if we if we take that statement. Um, this, if we take that statement, it says here, a statement is true if what it means and says is in accordance with the matter about which the statement is made. Yeah. So if I say this is gold, and it is really gold, then the statement is true. Yeah. Yeah. The gold can be true gold or fake gold. If it's fake gold, then the statement is not true, of course. And you say, well, what is the difference between these two forms of truth? Mm. Yeah. Um, could you have a, a fake proposition? Could you have a proposition that merely seems to be the proposition, but it wasn't really? So I can have, uh, can we, we can have true love and, and false love, or, or yeah. it's not really love. Mm -hmm. But can we have, in that sense, can we have, it, it, you know, it looked like it was that proposition, but it really wasn't. No, we can't. No, right? and can you either can have it or not have it. Yeah, so that's strange, that there's something else going uh -huh. on there. Yeah? Another slightly related okay. to this was something that uh, the scholastic philosophers uh, mm -hmm. noticed. So we can say such su su such is uh, the, the gold is uh, is true, or the the, the money is uh, yeah. You would say that in English, yeah. Uh, but genuine in that sense. In that sense, you could use that word. You could mean, true, but you, you could say uh, yeah. But but you couldn't say um, so. So you can say true of something. Mm -hmm. But you can't say a truth of something. So you could say mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Socrates is true. He's a real yeah. philosopher. Mm -hmm. so you can't say Socrates is truth. But yeah. you can say God is truth. Yeah, if you, I mean, yeah. if you just yeah. speak to the theological language, then yeah. you can say God yeah. is truth. Yeah. 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 How yeah. is that possible? How is that, so there is a there is a big difference between an abstract concept 
veritas, truth, and the quality to be to be true or not. That's a that they play out at a totally different level. Mm. Um, so we can say we can say uh, Socrates is wise. But we can't say Socrates is wisdom, mm. but we can say God is wisdom. Okay, well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, that. so there is a bit of a difference, but um, at the same time, yeah, maybe uh, yeah, they do also have a lot to do with each other. Now, there is a third uh, classical notion, classical aspect to this notion of truth. And that is. Um, no, but we we'll get to that in a minute. Sorry. First, we'll first we'll take a look at this. So we have these two. We have we have a, a truth as, as as something that makes some things real, and truth as that which is a correspondence between a proposition or a zatz and a thing or a, a, a fact. And now the question is. Uh, so so what is that? Uh, he calls it Übereinstimmung, but that's also the traditional word for it. Correspondence or adequation. Mm -hmm. And um, the question now becomes, so what, what is this Übereinstimmung? What is that? And he says that in this paragraph, this paragraph on page 8, yeah? Diesen Doppelcharakter der Stimmens bringt die überlieferte Wesensumgrenzung der Wahrheit zum Vorschein. The traditional circumscription, the essence of truth. Veritas est adequatio rei et intellectus. Truth is the correspondence of the thing and the intellect. This can mean truth, das kann bedeuten, Wahrheit ist die Angleichung der Sache an die Erkenntnis. That shows a lot of understanding uh, on the side of Heidegger, because adequatio with the end with the, the suffix co means means a, a process or an activity. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's not just a, a state. Mm -hmm. yeah? That's why he says Angleichung. It's also is a bit, a bit uh, 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 ambiguous, so that's the correct translation. That is, that's often missed in the when we translate English as correspondence. Mm -hmm. yeah. We should say corresponding. Es kann aber auch sagen, Wahrheit ist die Angleichung der Erkenntnis an die Sache. Zwar trägt man die angeführte Wesensumgrenzung meist nur in der Form von Veritas das Adequatio Intellectus ad rem vorzubringen. So only from intellect to, to thing. Doch ist die so begriffene Wahrheit, die Satzwahrheit, nur möglich auf dem Grunde der Sachwahrheit, der Adequatio rei ad intellectum. Beide Wesensbegriffe der Veritas meinen stets ein sich richten nach und denken somit die Wahrheit als Richtigkeit, so truth as correctness. It's a very important distinction between truth as disclosure, mm -hmm. this is the truth, truth, uh, truth as freedom, it's the open, and truth as correctness. Yeah? And, and what he does here is, is to say this, this Richtigkeit has to do with Richten, with orienting, or with, di with a direction, and that is captured in this word adequatio, because adequatio is not just a static correspondence, but is an actual movement of, an activity of unbelieving, of coming to be the same as. There's a whole lot of scholastic philosophy behind this, uh, this paragraph. Um, Truth 
the propositional truth, the truth of the sentence or the proposition is only possible, so the truth by which I say that the, the cat is on the mat is only possible on the basis of what he calls here, and that's the classical scholastic term, Sachwahrheit. I don't know how that's translated into English. Material truth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it must be, uh, I don't know if that's the way the scholastics, scholastic philosophy, but it's, it comes from, from it, it's this thing, uh, true, true love, the truth as reality rather than yeah? mm -hmm. Um the, the proposition true, true, the propositional true statement is only possible on the basis of the Zahraheit, the Angleichung of the thing to the intellect. The thing has to be known, in other words, as what it is, before the true proposition can be made about it. Mm -hmm. You have to already know it. Yeah. Yeah? This, this, this leads to a whole host of traditional problems about, about truth uh, and about knowledge. Hardly anybody ever talks about it these days, but but in uh, so in order to he's basically saying in order to make a true proposition, you have mm. first of all to know <laughs> you've got to be in contact with the thing already, and you've got to know that the thing that my, I know the thing, for example, yeah, but I also know that I know the thing. Namely, that there is a difference between this thing and my knowledge of it. Mm. I have to be able to assess that it's not just my my perception that I'm perceiving this thing. So I have to have a measure by which I distinguish between my knowledge, my my the content of my experience, and the the thing itself that I know. If I don't have that, I cannot make a judgment. Mm -hmm. It's only in the judgment that the act of knowing comes to its complete final end, because then I can say, I know that that there is a red spectacle holder on the table. Um, but, but I have to have, before that, I, ha I have to have already, have, I already have to have this awareness of the difference between the, the real thing and my adequate knowledge of it. Do you see the point? That yeah. that's a, that's a, I think is a really mm -hmm. fundamental thing about knowledge, which which we very often forget when we try in modern epistemology. We very often forget about this this point that knowledge is always always involves knowing that what you know is not the knowing of it, but the know. Um, that it is an intentionality in a way, yeah? Mm -hmm. But it's required, that, I think that is what scholastic philosophy calls, or what, what pre-modern philosophy, why, why we call them realists, or why we say they're naive realists, and they're not naive realists, but they recognize that it's, it doesn't make, it makes sense to speak of knowledge if it's not, if you don't know that it's knowledge of something, that itself is not the knowledge, but the knowing. Yeah. Yeah. And do you also need this um, awareness of the knowledge as knowledge in order to make the judgment about whether what it is is true in the sense of being genuine or not? Yeah. Or, or does it refer to being able to make the yeah. True yeah. proposition. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you could say, well, whether something is, is genuinely what you think it is or not is something that might come out later mm -hmm. in your experience, and then you may have to adjust your concepts. So you could, um, but of course, ultimately you're right. You need you need this for both. Mm -hmm. So you could, but you could be, you could be mistaken. And then, yeah, that could then be the process, the philosophizing, or the thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, or, 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 or just the science, or experience. Uh -huh. I yeah. could say, oh, there's a golden uh, crown here, mm. 
and, uh, and that could be, a, a, in that sense, an adequate judgment. But then it turns out that actually the gold was mixed with uh, with uh, with, uh, with another metal. Mm -hmm. But I do f further mm -hmm. further research, and then I would have to adjust. Then that as yeah. I said, what I thought was a was a golden crown actually is a uh, is a. Uh, okay. Yeah. And my the idea is that that this kind of adequation, which, so, which is not as simplistic as many modern philosophers make it out to be, that there's just this correspondence, no, as we see now, as you hear, there's a whole process that, that creates this ability to make a good true proposition. Um, that this itself, again, is grounded in something else. And that is ontological truth, or Zijnswaarheid. So we have Zatswaarheid, Zachwaarheid, and Zijnswaarheid. What did you say first? Zatswaarheid, Zats. 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 Propositional truth? Zats. Zats. Yeah, Zats. Zatswaarheid, and then we have Zachwaarheid, and then we have Zijnswaarheid. And then... Um, and then it's still not enough for Heidegger because Heidegger then wants to say, well, this is Heinz Wahrheit, that's, that's where metaphysics goes wrong, um, and that's where we have to have my language of disclosure and the open and, and truth is freedom. This, uh, this process, this, this knowing that you know in, in, uh, in classical metaphysics is called the, the, the uh, it's an interesting term for you to know, for the cocktail hour. <laughs> it's called the Elitio Completa. The, the Venditio Completa is the complete return to itself of the knowing mind. So in the Aristotelian view, we, we know the world, um, that's the naive realism of Aristotle. We know the world, or of, also of the, the, the scholastics until Tilt uh, because uh, so if I if I know the the, the this red object, then the the red the form red is is in the thing. Really, they call that for formaliter. It's in the thing really, and it's in the mind intellectually. But it's the same form, <laughs> and that, therefore I know. So I know. And it is very, I think it's a very, uh, really important theory to understand media. I know, you could even call it medially, through the form. Through the form red, I know the redness of the, of the thing. Yeah? Or by the form red, I know the redness of the thing. But I can only come to the conclusion or to the judgment that thing is red, if I have performed, if the mind has performed this complete return to itself, by which it comes to know, or to realize, as it were, that the form in my head is, is the same as the form there. I have to, I have to make the distinction between the thing and my knowledge of the thing, or between the forms as real and the form as in my head, in order through the form to be able to know that thing. If I say it correctly, yeah, I think that's, a, that's how it is. So we're laughing. <laughs> so with that experience, if you all of a sudden see the same object in a different color and you've never seen it before, you, to understand that it's the same real true object, yeah. but it's in a different colour. It goes via the mind first. 
or how do we translate that? If you if I if I were to look at this in yeah. a, in a, in a room that had a different lighting, yeah. then what is now red would, would maybe be orange. as blue or yeah. orange or whatever. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, that would be, but but then nevertheless, well, either the same situation would obtain in which I knew that that thing is yeah. now blue, uh, just as I know now that it yeah. is red. Yeah. In that sense, there is there is no difference between the two situations. The only question you could ask is, well, is it more red now yeah. than it's blue then? That's a difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> I would say probably not, because mm -hmm. there is no denying. Yeah. So the fact that, the, that this thing, that I can say this thing is really red, and I know it, is, is not, in my view, is not vitiated by the, the fact that I have a physical theory that explains to me that, of course, this thing isn't really red, but it is the way the light falls on it in my eyes, and etc., etc. I think I, I would like to say, but that's not quite an easy thing to, to argue, maybe, but I would like to say that account, yeah, great, I've got no problem with it, but it doesn't mean that this thing isn't red. Uh, it's still red. It's still that red box. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. know, but that, that's yeah. what I'd like to, yeah. I don't know if that's adequate, because you could say, oh, well, how can that be? Because they are, they can't really be. <laughs> and I've, I've, I've got, read a book once written by a physicist about the, the, the real world, what it really is, and he said, and he writes somewhere, you know, people don't realize that colors don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> the whole world is not, yeah. is not really colored. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And then, what about the truth? I mean, is it that true that it is red? Or is it something completely different? I'm off um, I, I think it's true that it's red, yeah. Yeah, but if you are colorblind, you see a green, and uh, so, how do we? Do it. I count all the people who see it red, and there's only one who sees the green, so the red ones are winners. Well, yeah, and they, uh, yeah, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I also would say, well, if there are ten people and nine of them think it's red and one thinks it's green, probably the nine Alright, oh, they say the truth, but well, the green one also says the truth. It's uh, difficult. Do, do, we, do we say, I see this as red? No, we say it is red. But somebody else sees it as, as something else? Um, that, that's that's a un, I undeniably true, I think. If you're colorblind, then you don't and we don't even know if what I see is the same as what you see. Yeah. You know, how we can never find out. Uh, so it's the truth for that individual's perception, because I see this as red, so I will make the true statement, this object is red. Well, it's not really red. I mean, it's a, it's a shade of a different... It's but let's say, yeah, yeah, let's say you or perhaps Another person that is color blind and would see this in green would make the same statement: "This object is green," because this is the way the person sees yeah. or perceives it. Yeah, I mean, I mean so for that and, person, and, and, it's and, true. Yeah, and you know, maybe this the, the famous thought experiment. So, how do I know that what you call red and what I call red, that you don't see it as green, yeah. and I, yeah. what I call green, and you as red? Yeah? We could never find out if that was the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. I have the feeling. But that I think the error is that stupid. What I no problem in. Uh, no, no, no. no, I mean, I mean, what I what <laughs> I think I'm of um, with my um, contribution. I I have gotten on the wrong track here. Yeah. Well, what we, we, you were trying to say is, oh, it's not really red, and in a different sense. 
Uh, yeah, uh, well, we were on about the tools, no? Yeah, yeah, okay, we were talking about the, the, the sapphire. So yeah. about the tools. So about the truth. You can say, artists might say, no, look, it's not really red. Here there's a dark patch and there are white patches there. Yeah, it's, it's red. Pure red is a different color. Pure red is different. It's a, it's a mixed color anyway. And if I was to... If I want to into orange. If I want to make a drawing of it, then I would need... Then I would, just to get the light on the surface, I would have to use a white pencil or something like that. Yeah? So it's on, even to say it's red is an abstraction in that sense. But I think the, the point of the Zachwaarheid, or the Adequatio Reiat Intellectum, is not about these things. The, 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 I, I think these are all valid points to make. But the, the fact that I I think what, what uh, the scholastics are trying to say, the fact that I live in a world, but that I am in this world, and in this world there is this thing, and I know this thing, in whatever way I am able to know it, it if I wouldn't have the perception of color, I wouldn't see that, I wouldn't see, you know, um, that is real. So what real means is... That it's not hard. Yeah, is that, 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 that is the right thing there. So that I... The, yeah. The, you can never begin to understand what it means to say that, that we live in a world that we experience if you try to build up this world from the sense impressions that, that we have. If you say, well, we get all sorts of sense impressions, sense data, or whatever, and then we build up the world out of that, but you have different sense data from mine, so it's going to be a little bit different, etc. But we don't really know. This whole classical modern view, Descartes, Kant, this, you know, I think what, what classical philosophy tried to get at was to say, that's the wrong start. You know, if you start that way, you're never going to get there. Um, and, and the, the Repetio Completa is a, is, is a way of, or even Aristotle's notion to say, the form is in the thing, realiter, and in the mind, intellectualiter, so it's more mentally in the, in the mind, really in the thing, is a way of foreclosing that, that, what, that you try to, to, to analyze what it means that we have a world that we experience in which we live and try to foreclose that the avenue where you try to explain that by purely by construction of the or, or, you know a matter cognitive construction. Yeah. And and this is what I meant with the medial point. So the knowing is a or form or qualia, qualities, etc. are media for classical philosophy. They are not representations. They are media through which we are in touch with things. But with medium things, <laughs> yeah. It's very subtle. Uh, in my mind, it's a very subtle, subtle theory. And it's in the background here because it enables Heidegger to also, what he does here, circumvent this whole question of representation, representationalism, and correspondence as kind of representationalism. Um, you know, Wittgenstein writes in the track out as sort of skeptically, sort of almost ironically says about the uh, theory of truth as correspondence or as the similitude between proposition and, uh, and, uh, and the fact. Mm -hmm. He says, yeah, in what sense could, uh, could, uh, could the sentence, uh, could the sentence that, that that's a right uh, as spectacle case, in what sense is that like the, the spectacle case, it's not red, it, you can't put anything in it, it's, so he tries to ridicule this notion of, of adequatio über Einstimmung by saying yeah, they don't look like each other at all, <laughs> but that's missing the point, yeah? I hope that that's clear now. Um, and it's because uh, Adam is aware of all of this, I think, that he can, uh, that he can um, come to his, his theory of truth as the open, as disclosure. Yeah. 
We're back on the old track, aren't we? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, it's good, it's good. It's good. Um, yeah, so what was his point about the 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 creed, the, the 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 creator? the creator. Yeah, so there's a point why in classical philosophy mm -hmm. there's quite important point to notice. Um, this on page eight, huh? So Kant also talks about Richter, uh, Richtung. Mm -hmm. And Kant says, the Gegenstände richten sich nach, nach uh, unserer Erkenntnis. Things orient or direct themselves to our knowledge. We, 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 we know that we, we create the representation, or we create experiences ourselves because the, we don't know the thing in itself. But what we know, we know because, because our forms of understanding are applied to this material of the senses that we, we don't know what it is. So the things, so Kant solves the problem of, of, of Übereinstimmung by saying, well, these things are preformed by our cognitive capacities. And he does that because he thinks in a representationalist way. So he thinks knowing is having the right representation, but how can you have know if you have the right representation? Right is also Richtung, yeah. The right representation if you can't know the thing that is represented. But if you know right representation, you can't can never have access to the thing represented. This is the same problem as the which the complete has solved in, in, in this elegant way. So he has to say, oh, this, this Richtigkeit, rightness, has to come from somewhere else. I have to go the other way. It comes from the mind itself. That puts the forms in the things. And then I judge that. I judge it right. <laughs> yeah, that is the modern subjectivist epistemological doctrine. Yeah? Uh, how is it possible that the pre-moderns didn't have to do that? go into that whole conundrum which leads directly to the dialectic in Hegel when Hegel says this thing in itself doesn't mean anything so I might as well just deal with the representations and they are real yeah? mm -hmm. then, then, they, then it becomes a process yeah, in a different way but the, 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 the pre-moderns didn't have to do that he says here why? because this form that's in the thing has been put there by God <laughs> so the idea, the form, mm -hmm. that which is known, we, we, the human mind, knows yeah. because it, it, it directs itself as richtet sich nach mm -hmm. the form and the thing. Mm -hmm. But the form is in the thing because the mind of God knows it, i.e. created it. Now I understand, yeah. yeah? yeah and so we have, so all we have to do is through knowing the world, have better and better and better. We put ourselves in the in the in God's uh, mm -hmm. own shoes, but but we never become God because that would mean that yeah. when we know it, our knowing would be a creating. But it's but but the idea, the idea, the form mediates God and the thing and mm -hmm. God, the world and the, and the human mind, and that's why 
again, why do I do it? Why do I have to form as a medium? Mm -hmm. Yeah? It's like some sort of an idealization of matter. Well, of course, it's a complete idealism in that sense. Yeah. 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 But it's, but it's, that's right. In that sense, it's an idealism, but in the sense, so it's, a, it's an, uh, an idealism in terms of the, the relation idealism materialism, mm -hmm. but it's not an idealism in terms of the relation idealism realism. Mm -hmm. It's a realism. Kant and modern epistemology is idealist in the mm -hmm. in, in the sense idealism versus realism, but in the sense idealism versus materialism, this is an this classical philosophy is an idealism. Mm -hmm. So now we can also understand why. They may have uh, may have confused you at certain points in time. Why we, on the one hand, have idealism versus materialism, and on the other hand, idealism versus realism. In history of philosophy, we always have this. Uh, we use this word idealism as a as either in opposition to materialism or in opposition to realism. But now we understand how this works, <laughs> don't we? More. <laughs> 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 Speaking of <laughs> promise. <laughs> um, okay. Now. That means. Sachbarheit. Bedeutet immer die Einstimmigkeit des vorhandenen Dinges mit seinem vernünftigen Wesensbegriff. So that's with the idea as the divine creating intellect. Der Anschein entsteht. Diese Bestimmung des Wesens der Wahrheit bleibe unabhängig von der Auslegung des Wesens des Seins alles Seienden die jeweils eine entsprechende Auslegung des Wesens des Menschen als des Trägers und Vollziehers des Intellektus einschließt. So gewinnt die Formel für das Wesen der Wahrheit, für das ist das Quatsch Intellektus der Dreh, ihre für jedermann sogleich einsichtige Gemeingültigkeit. So back to our Selbstverständlichkeit. That we say, Truth is the correspondence of the, and the thought I'm doing, it's the most obvious thing there is. I lost page, page 9 at the bottom. Yeah. yeah. So, that, 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 that the essence of the propositional truth is to be found in the correctness of the proposition, is that is how truth now appears in its most unquestioned, unquestionable form. Unter der Herrschaft der in ihren Wesensgründen kaum beachteten Selbstverständlichkeit dieses Wahrheitsbegriffes nimmt man auch als gleich selbstverständlich hin, dass die Wahrheit ein Gegenteil hat und dass es die Unwahrheit Die Unwahrheit des Satzes, so als Unrichtigkeit, ist das Nicht-Übereinstimmen der Aussage mit der Sache. Die Unwahrheit der Sache, so Unechtheit, das not genuine, bedeutet das Nicht-Übereinstimmen des Seienden mit seinem Wesen. So if it says fake gold, then, then that, whatever it is, is not in, in correspondence with, its, with the essence of gold. Jedes Mal lässt sich die Unwahrheit als ein Nicht-Stimmen begreifen. Nicht-Stimmen. And it's a beautiful play on the German. Eh? So the Stimmen, we have the Übereinstimmung, but also Nicht-Stimmen, es stimmt etwas nicht. Eh? Uh, and the Stimme from, in a deeper sense, from Anspruch. Dieses fällt aus dem Wesen der Wahrheit heraus. Deshalb kann die Unwahrheit als solches Gegenteil der Wahrheit, da wo es die Erfassung des reinen Wesens der Wahrheit gilt, auf die Seite gestellt werden. So we think we don't have to talk about 
falsehood when we talk about truth. Now, yeah, we're going to stop here now because it's the six o'clock. But this this whole uh, edifice, which um, so we we have seen that it takes some thinking to get into the question. And then we have seen that the traditional way of answering the question about the essence of truth is a little bit more subtle than we genuinely, gen, than we, than we usually think. But we've also seen that, according to Heidegger, it is precisely this quite subtle way of thinking about truth that leads to the the unquestioned idea of truth as correctness. And now, in the next bit, he's going to, yeah, to, to deconstruct all of this yeah, and, and get into what he calls then here the, the inner possibility of this correspondence or adequatio, and that leads us to truth as an opening, or truth as an, as, as an open, which is very, a very different kind of thing from truth as correctness. Yeah? Okay, and, and it's that open that we have to get to, as I have claimed at the beginning, if we want to move on with our idea of process.